Are you looking for a 450 wheel horsepower, all day long, reliable, tested, affordable solution, which is 100% bolt-on for the EA888? We've got something for you. Welcome back. Here's a great video for you guys. We're talking about the EA888.3 once again and we've been asked many times and for quite a long time by you guys out there for a bolt-on setup that will be able to provide 400 to 450 wheel horsepower easily without having to run huge boost pressures above 2.2 bar boost to achieve and at the same time you will not have to upgrade your fuel system in order to achieve this. We've been hard at work for quite a while playing around with different internal rotating assembly combinations and we have come up with something that resembles the G25 550 in terms of response, the size of the rotating assembly, but with a bit of a twist. So guys, there's a lot of products out there as I've mentioned that have got an offering and there's so many different combinations. The most popular, which is Chinese, it is a, a Chinese derivative or Chinese derived, um, manufactured by the Chinese and it's really, really cheap. You can find this stuff for $200 or whatever it is on your online shopping platforms and you are able to get a TDO6 Mitsubishi, TDO6 turbine head with a five or a six blade Mitsubishi TDO6 uh, splitter type compressor combination and obviously this is a turbine head welded onto the original standard dimension shaft which then fits into the original bearing housing journal bearing on your IS38 turbocharger as well as with the uh, the bullet compressor on the other side and obviously you guys have seen my other videos as to why they fail they're obviously overloading the bearing system that's for another video I'll put that video uh, that, that, that discusses those uh, failures down in the description below but then guys have said, okay, well, let's try and change the bearing system, which is essentially what we went and did about three or four years ago. And uh, we beefed up, we took the, the bearing housing, we kept the standard bearing housing, we remodeled the internals, we beefed up the thrust assembly, the shaft thickness where the journals run, as well as after the shoulder where the actual compressor wheel fits over. And we redesigned the journal bearings, the thrust bearing, the thrust pads, etc., etc. And we came up with a turbocharger called the IS. 38600, which I'll also leave a link to the to, to the product in the description below as well. And that's a 100% reliable setup. I've been running that on our de development car for probably 25,000 kilometers at uh, quite high boost pressures uh, on the limit of where I needed to start upgrading the fuel system. So approximately or approaching 500 wheel horsepower and um, I've never seen a day's trouble with it. So that side of, the thing, side of things is, is, is proven. We also have an IS38700, which is essentially our own larger AR turbine and compressor housing, which basically allows the rotating assembly from a genuine Garrett GTX 3071 Generation 2 to run inside of, and that's obviously working very, very well as well. You can contact guys that are, in my opinion, the leaders in terms of tuning the CMOS ECUs. Uh, Thanos from GT Innovation in Germany, he runs one of those turbos on his own personal car and he's destroyed some big cars making big numbers with it, be that as it may. Many people have asked me, please will you design or bring out or invent a turbocharger which does not require the expensive, unreliable, complicated fuel system upgrades in order to make the power. But at the same time, there's another twist to that. A lot of people want a streetable solution, lightning fast response similar to the stock IS38, but with a bit of a punch that'll get them 450 to approaching 500 wheel horsepower, which will not require a fuel system upgrade. But because the turbocharger doesn't make much more than that, it will be able to be a smaller rotating assembly, a more responsive rotating assembly. And even though we've now gone and brought out a larger AR, it's not as big, we're not gonna reveal the numbers, but it's not as large as the stainless version that we've got in our IS38 600 and 700. So what we've tried to do with this specific turbo I'm gonna show you now, is try and keep the, the low down response, the punch response, and obviously a nice smooth linear delivery of power up to your 450, which is where I would stop for saving the engine's sake, 
Um, and, you know, at that point, you'll be coming to cl quite close to actually uh, the limit where you need to start upgrading the fuel system. That's essentially the turbocharger we've brought to the table. So nice low down response, punch response, smooth delivery up to about 400 to 450 wheel horsepower, depending on where you want to run the boost pressures. There's a lot more to bringing a turbocharger out than just thumb sucking and going, well, make it three millimeters bigger here, make it five millimeters bigger there, and well, let's just, I don't know, 20% more, or well, what are Mitsubishi offering? What are Borg Warner offering? What does Garrett have? Let's just take a design from one of those guys, combine it, and surely it should work. They work on the Subaru, so why can't it work on the VW? It's not what we do at Turbo Direct. That's the reason it's taken us so long to release this turbocharger. Number one, the heart of the turbocharger is the bearing cartridge. That's where we spend most of our time, effort, and money making sure that whatever turbocharger we release is reliable. Is reliable at the boost pressure required to run to make the claimed horsepower of the rotating assembly. Great, so we've ticked that box. What are we gonna choose in terms of the rotating assembly itself? What compressor design, what turbine design, where do we want the power to start coming in? How is it going to interact with the AR of the turbine housing? What sort of tongue dimensions? Remember the video I posted regarding uh, a little bit more about turbine housings and the gas path effects? Well, that comes into play. So the internal structure of the turbine housing we're using is different to, well, get hold of the guys in China, get them to just copy a IS38 or an IS20 or whatever turbine housing and just machine it for a bigger wheel. It's not what we do. If you cut open our housings, you will be able to see that there's a lot more going on inside there than just a thumb suck copy that's bought off the shelf from Alibaba.com or whatever the case might be. The same goes with the compressor housing. Sure, we've just increased the AR, but what combination compressor, what combination turbine? Will the turbine work well with the internal structure of the turbine housing we've chosen? If not, what do we do? And that's basically brought us to the solid disc back turbine wheel that we're basically using. This is not a copy of anything. It is not a turbine wheel that you can go and purchase. We don't believe in the knockoff uh, knock route. We've actually gone and taken a solid disc back GT style with quite an aggressive cutback, obviously for high cycle fatigue. It's getting technical, guys, but there's quite a lot of people that have asked me this information that are technical, that want to go technical. If I lose you, just comment down in the section below and I'll obviously answer, I'll come back to you as fast and uh, as, as comprehensive as I can. So we've got quite an aggressive cutback, solid disc back, uh, a wheel and obviously being solid disc back, the wheel is heavier. So we've had to change some of the, the, the dimensions on the inducer and exducer blades, the tip height. So it, it, it resembles the frame size of a G25 550, but we are using a forged compressor, solid, solid disc back turbine and dual ball bearing internally with the standard bolt on outside bearing structure with obviously larger AR, very slightly, but larger AR turbine and compressor, as well as tongue design inside. Okay, so this is a solid disc back turbine wheel. Don't worry about what make and what, uh, what style and what manufacturer it is. All I wanted to show you was where your inducer blades over there basically go vertically down to the solid disc back as opposed to a wheel that does not have a solid disc back and has scallops in it. Um, there are various reasons why you would use a solid disc back as opposed to scallops, especially when you start talking about mixed flow uh, turbines as opposed to 100% radial, but be that as it may. I hope you guys learned a little bit about the two turbine shafts. Yes, they're not the same family. Yes, they're not the same design. Doesn't matter. I just use them to show you the difference between the solid disc back and the scallops. Um, a little bit more about this turbocharger. Now, the only thing that we do not supply you is an electronic actuator. We don't believe in the knockoff stuff. It's rubbish. Take your original unit that came off of your IS-38, transplant it. But guys, the other component that you need to just transplant over, obviously, is your oxygen sensor, which is basically installed into the turbine housing in exactly the same position as the OEM unit. It's, it's been long-winded. I've shared a lot of information. Let's get into some pictures now and close-ups of the actual turbocharger so you guys can see exactly what we're talking about, and we'll go from there. So this is a close-up of our solid disc back turbine. You'll notice that the inducer and exducer blades are almost exactly the same size. And a nine blade high flow forged billet compressor that we use point milling uh, mill cycle on. 
Well, guys, so this is the, uh, the what we call our IS38450. Okay, it is a complete turbocharger, dual ball bearing, and it includes a muffler delete. I'm going to use, should I say, reuse my electronic DV from my uh, original turbocharger, and I want to reinstall it onto here. But there's one little trick. We have not gone and machined the little locator pin or the, the locator hole for this little pin over here, the nipple that you find on the bottom of the diverter valve. So if you want to use the DV, you just need to go and uh, cut that little nipple off and then you will be able to get a nice flush seal on the face over here. You know, the only reason that that little pin is there is so that you don't install the diverter valve onto the turbocharger in the incorrect orientation because you won't be able to get your plug to plug back on. Right guys, so that's where the little nipple used to be. I've just uh, taken a file and manually gone and filed it off by hand and the DV is ready for installation. The other thing that you need to do is transfer your electronic actuator. Now in the kit, you have obviously got, depending on which of the two actuators you use, sometimes the rods are slightly shorter. I'm talking about the rod over here. So we give you a little extension piece that's included as well. Um, obviously this one hasn't uh, had a problem in terms of the, the rod length. It screws directly into the, the, the fitting that's already attached to the, uh, the swing valve or the crank that controls the swing valve. And obviously I've just left this, this lock nut loose. I just give it a bit of tension so that the uh, uh, um, ceiling disc on the swing valve is, is a little bit tight on the ceiling face. And I leave this uh, lock, lock, lock nut loose so that once I've connected VCDS, set my desired voltage, I can then obviously just come back tighten up this lock nut and uh, nip it so that the shaft isn't able to move thereafter. There you'll see a nice picture of the turbine shaft. And obviously the compressor wheel there. That's pretty much what we basically bring into the table today. We're gonna take this turbocharger down to the workshop now and we're actually gonna do the installation. We're gonna start the installation. We're not gonna cover on video the entire installation of the tedious process, process of actually connecting up everything. So what you guys see there is the two compoundings next to each other. You'll notice the one on the left hand side. It's only slightly, but it is a, larger, a slightly larger AR, uh, obviously to allow the uh, additional flow of the larger compressor wheel inside. And uh, next I'm gonna show you the two turbine housing volutes next to each other. So guys, you'll see that uh, the turbine housings are not exactly the same. Uh, our scroll has got a slightly longer scroll to it and the actual diameter um, is, is slightly bigger than the uh, original. However, the position and mounting faces, etc., obviously still stay in the same place. Two turbine housings with the rotating assemblies inside of each other. You can obviously see the noticeable difference in additional size with the ball bearing unit on the left. It looks very similar from the outside to your other nine blade uh, derivatives, obviously just being like slightly smaller. However, you will see that the, uh, I don't know if you can see all the way in there, it has a solid disc at the back as opposed to the stock IHI unit, which does not. Okay, so you can see we're running the stock rear silencer box uh, and obviously resonator box over here coming into the upgraded Turbo Direct downpipe. This is our bolt-on downpipe. It's got the stainless steel mesh welded onto it, the heat shield. And obviously everything is bolt-on. This is a 76 mil, three inch downpipe. And as you can see up top there, the turbocharger has been removed and it's time for us to start installing the IS38450.
Right guys, we are looking at the logs now. This is the logs that we just did on the dyno. This is about the fourth run that we've done. Uh, just an inertia run. It's obviously still getting uh, through its adaption phase. Um, obviously we just loaded software now, so there's gonna be a few runs before the, uh, the ECU settles down. But after about the fourth run, all we're looking for specifically is ignition per, or should I say retard per, per ignition event. This is the cylinder one column over here. And uh, it was minus one and a half degrees, which is quite a lot. Um, and then it tapers down to 0.75 of a degree. And then it picks up again at about two, 2,800 RPM and starts removing timing again. And then it starts to advance slightly um, and then goes away up until the end of the run. Now let's look at cylinder two, which is this column here. So from around about two, two and a half thousand RPM, it starts to pick up. Um, it starts to fall away at around about 2800 it picks up to minus three degrees which is a lot that's a hell of a lot of uh, timing retard per knock event and it goes all the way down to 3100 rpm etc etc and the same thing happens with cylinder three um it just starts moving around i mean we're looking at 3.3 degrees which is very very high and cylinder four we're looking at about 4.8 almost five degrees of retard so that explains why the graph is not that smooth and the fuel that we're using in this specific instance is a normal 95 pump fuel. We're boosting 1.8 bar. Uh, this is obviously your charge air pressure here, the actual value, but this is absolute. So this takes into account atmospheric, which on the day was 0.843. Uh, so the highest value we recorded was around about 2661. Uh, so that basically leaves you with about 1.8 bar gauge pressure. Um, at that point. So it's about 1.7, 1.75 up to 1.8 bar peak and then obviously falls away again as the RPM goes up. So we're using 95 octane pump fuel with water meth injection. That's it. We did put some octane boost into the uh, into the tank uh, after we did the four or five runs on the dyno when we drove the car on the road. Did a couple more logs and uh, the retired per knock event went away. We didn't, however, get a power reading, but this is pretty much what we look for when we do uh, some of the logs on the actual dyno. So, you know, obviously RPM, retired per, per knock event, cylinder one, two, three, and four, uh, your air intake, intake air temps, and obviously your boost pressure. Intake, intake air temps went from 40 degrees once the meth starts to, uh, to, to spray, and obviously in conjunction with the intercooler, down to 21 stable 22 22 degrees obviously then uh, we've come off the throttle and uh, things will normalize from there but um yeah it's it's basically it's really really good we're happy with the intercooler remember this is a stock a stock exhaust system uh, the only mods we have is obviously it's a forged engine forged pistons and rods same compression ratio um we're running one of our is38 450 turbos uh, front mount intercooler with charge pipes, water meth injection, and downpipe. That's it. We don't have a full exhaust system. We don't have an intake upgrade. This is a stock airbox, stock intake going to the turbocharger. Um, the only part of the intake that's upgraded is a 90 degree bend that leads to the inlet of the turbo of the compressor housing. Um, the rest of the car is basically stock standard outside of the downpipe, water meth, in and uh, turbo and intercooler. So intake and exhaust is completely stock. We're still doing uh, 479, call it 480 horsepower. And uh, we're very happy. We're happy with the response. We're happy with the logs. And that's basically that. Right, guys. So this is a run that we did uh, against one of the popular UK 500 horsepower turbochargers. Um, as you can see the date, this was done in December 2020 and obviously the run that we did on the Turbo Direct car with the IS38 450 was done in 2021. So a couple months apart, um, but at the same time, have a look at the horsepower. So boost pressure was the same um, and we made a little bit more horsepower and considerable amount more torque but have a look at the RPM response difference. So the green line is the horsepower from the uh, UK-based turbocharger, and the red is the torque. The blue or dark blue 
uh, line will be the, the horsepower from the Turbo Direct turbocharger and the orange will be the torque from the Turbo Direct uh, Turbo. So yes, the graph is smoother obviously because of the fact that there's no knock. Um, that specific car had full intake, full exhaust, uh, front mount intercooler upgrade and a couple of other things as well. Uh, our car basically runs the stock intake and airbox and stock uh, exhaust system. The rest has been upgraded. So you can see that it's approximately 500 RPM faster spool from the IS38 450. Uh, with Octane Boost, I am of the belief that that graph or that dip has been turned upside down and uh, obviously that same uh, dip over there has been turned upside down. So you'll probably see a couple more newtons and a couple more horsepower, uh, which basically will then smooth that graph out. It's just in this area here uh, from around about 3637 up to about 4,500 RPM where there's considerable knock on cylinders three and four as you've seen on the other little uh, video excerpt. But uh, with the Octane Boost uh, in the car, you actually feel that that is, uh, that is gone. So the car feels really, really strong, extremely uh, responsive, and uh, it's about a 500 RPM, approximately 500 RPM, maybe, uh, maybe a bit more, um, better response than one of the overseas uh, UK-based turbochargers. So that's basically a, a nice comparison, um, and especially when you consider the price. You know, our product is approximately 35 to 40 percent less than uh, that specific product, and uh, it also delivers the goods. I hope you guys enjoyed that long-winded um, video. Uh, I know there's been a lot of talking, but uh, I wanted to bring everybody up to speed as to what we've done with an IS38 450. Hope you liked it. Please comment down below, like, subscribe. Catch you guys next time.